Whelan Presley Funeral Home and Crematory, a proud supporter of WQPT, has been serving Quad City families since 1889. Now providing live stream capabilities for viewing your loved one's funeral or memorial service at their chapel in Rock Island. The fallout from the 2020 election, the local impact, the winners, the losers, it's the cities. Ballots are still being counted in state after state, but for the most part, the votes in Illinois and Iowa have been tabulated. For many people, it all started with the Iowa caucuses, which should have been an indication of just how much the rest of 2020 would unfold. It was messy. It gave some people a black eye, and it was not resolved for days. Does that sound familiar? That was the caucus. What about now? Well, we're joined by two political veterans, Scott County Democratic Chair Alicia Gaiman and Scott County Republican Chair David Millage. It's a day after review of just what unfolded on election day. Alicia, let me start with you. Are, are any surprises? I mean, are you surprised how close this national election between Donald Trump and Joe Biden became? Um, I don't think so. I mean, the polling was pretty indi indicative of having a tight race and not necessarily knowing results uh, last night. Having kind of survived the Iowa caucus reporting uh, drama, I'm, I'm actually pretty happy that the press were really prepping people to be prepared for that. So there wasn't complete panic, but I don't think it was totally shocking and I'm not surprised that we still don't have results in some of the key races. Yeah, and, and David, I mean, there was, there was discussion about whether or not uh, uh, President Trump might lose some of the states that he had won four years ago, and that does not seem to be the case at all. Well, I think he may lose a couple of the states that he carried uh, in 2016. We haven't got the final results, of course, from Wisconsin, Michigan, or Arizona, but those races are very tight in Pennsylvania and could go into the, the Biden column. So he may lose a couple of states. Yeah, towards the end of the count, that might be expected. I mean, Arizona, of course, is, is the big state that uh, flipped early, in fact. Uh, let's talk about turnout. Uh, well, Dave, no, but... I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, Arizona tightened up, and they almost took back their, their projection. It's tightened up a lot, and there are still a lot of outstanding votes in Arizona that are mostly rural uh, votes that would presumably go towards uh, Trump. Let's talk about turnout, David. Um, it, it was amazing. Early voting, incredible in this year of a pandemic. Is this something that you expect in years to come, that there's going to be a greater push for early voting or off-site voting, so to speak? Yes, I think, I think it, it worked well. We had a big turnout of the early voters, and the early voters is a lot more safe than, than um, mail-in absentee voting, where you have to go through the post office and go through four steps to vote. Early voting is just like going to the polls on election day, except that your vote doesn't go into a machine, it goes in an envelope to be counted, counted later. But it worked well, it led to higher turnout. I think we'll see it in the future, and uh, maybe more of it. Are you really happy with the way that the count went in Scott County, not only the turnout, but the way it was counted? Yes, very much so. I think starting the, um, the vote count of the, of the absentee and early voting on Saturday and having the results at 9 o'clock on Tuesday night was phenomenal work and, and speaks well of the people who work the polls. Alicia, you were talking about uh, some concerns that Democrats had as far as the vote count is, 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 is as far as Scott County is concerned. Mm -hmm. Well, we definitely um, aren't necessarily concerned about the process. We think all of the volunteers and poll watchers and poll workers did a fantastic job. They put in really long hours this cycle. We obviously have a couple of really close races that we're watching, and so there's that small trickle of ballots and, and um, you know, the 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 one the little nuances I guess that come up on election day so we are very close in a couple races and I anticipate recounts well and let's talk about one in particular Alicia the the uh, second congressional district for Iowa uh, between Marionette Miller Meeks the Republican and Rita Hart the Democrat fewer than 300 votes separating them in a whole district that stretches much of southeastern Iowa obviously that is one of the areas you're keeping a real close eye on yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's not just for Scott County. Obviously, we're looking at a lot of counties in that situation. 
Um, so we'll, we'll be probably doing a canvas um, district-wide for that particular seat. A critically important seat as well because it's Dave Loebsack's seat. It is a Democratic seat right now. I mean, a loss to uh, Miller Meeks would be a big blow to Democrats, would it not? Um, it's definitely it a seat. A we don't, we don't ever, <laughs> we never want to give up a seat in an election. So that is definitely true. Um, I, you know, it is a tough district. It's always been a tough district. Dave was an incredible moderate uh, when he served and definitely was able to bridge that gap with no parties and Republicans. Um, and so it's, it's a change for us, but I think, you know, we, we're going to keep working and make sure every vote gets counted. And David, I mean, if Miller Meeks does prevail as the winner in the second congressional district, what a huge pickup for Republicans. It, it is a huge pickup, and it would mean that Iowa has three of its four members of Congress would be Republican, which is a flip from the way it was just last, well, right now, where it's three, three Democrats and, and one Republican. So it's, it's a big pickup. It's a big pickup for Iowa. It's a big pickup nationally. And nobody probably worked harder than, than Marionette uh, in campaigning for that seat. And I know she'll do it. If she's the eventual winner, and I think she will be, um, I think she'll be a great representative. Well, David, as you were pointing out, if you think of the first congressional district to the north of the Quad Cities with uh, Abby Finkenauer, Ashley Hinson, the Republican winning there, as, as you're pointing out, that would make all, if Miller Meeks once again prevails, that would make all of eastern Iowa uh, Republican held in the congressional delegation. That's a big deal because eastern Iowa is often thought of as, as, as kind of bluish. It is. It is deemed bluish and now this will dispel that notion by having all of its congress members of congress um being republican why do you think that is i mean is it hard work by the party I, I'm, I'm sure you're going to say it's a quality candidates as well but i mean do you feel that there's some kind of a sea change in eastern iowa there may well there may be a, a sea change in eastern iowa it's um it's the biggest part of the state number one and it's um it's highly educated with, with uh, the universities being in the first, uh, well, I guess Ames is more middle, but, but um, UNI and, and the University of Iowa being in the uh, eastern side of the state, I think it makes it a more educated uh, part of the state. And um, there's a, a big mixture of jobs. It's not completely blue collar. It's not completely white collar. It's not completely agriculture. It's got a little bit of, of all. And uh, it'll be, It'll be well served by the by the leaders we've chosen. Well, Alicia, we were talking about the fact that Eastern Iowa seems to be changing and maybe swaying a little more towards the Republicans. And when you think of Eastern Iowa historically, you were thinking like Dubuque was always very Democratic. You you were thinking that Scott County, of course, Johnson County, the, the home of Iowa City, being Democratic, real strongholds there. And that's not really the case anymore. Why is this changing in Iowa? Well, I don't know that you can necessarily use this particular election as a bellwether for, you know, a trend change. Um, I, you know, the one thing that hasn't been talked about a lot here locally is the fact that we had pretty low voter turnout between 18 and 35 year olds. Um, and then also con considering the congressional district, that's going to have a large impact um, on, the co on the college campuses. And we do have a lot of folks learning remotely for COVID. So a lot of students that would normally be voting and usually voting um, Democratic weren't actually in state, you know, at school at that time to do so. And so, um, you know, despite efforts to get folks early registered and stuff like that, we definitely saw a dip in that. I know going into the election, I haven't seen the post-election numbers for that age demographic, but we were 13% in 2016, and we only had 6.5% going in um, as far as early votes uh, that had been cast as of Monday. And, and I understand that argument, um, is, is that perhaps it wasn't as easy for uh, younger people to vote than ever, but I mean, people were setting this up as such a consequential election, and that every vote counts that you learned four years ago. What more does it take to get some people to get out and vote? You know, and I, as a young, <laughs> as somebody who was young and elected at 28, um, it is, it's disheartening to see that our turnout was so low for the younger folks. And I, I, you know, that's something I think that needs to be looked at and studied and we need to address how, 
how we can kind of break that trend. And that is not necessarily a trend that we saw nationally. It, it is more unique um, here locally. And so I think that our, you know, our local leaders are going to have to really take a look at how that is compiled and, and what's, what's driving that up and down. David, once again, in Iowa, a pretty good night for Republicans. Let's talk about the state legislature as well. Uh, one thing that we noticed from the vote is that incumbents did just fine as far as uh, this area is concerned. About three weeks ago, there were reports that the Democrats thought they had a chance of taking over the Iowa House, and instead the Republicans picked up, I believe, as many as seven seats statewide. That's a pretty good night for Republicans in the state house. That's, that's true, and I, um, I filmed another program with Alicia about two weeks ago where she said they were hoping to pick up three seats here in Scott County from, from the Republicans. I believe she was referring to the Gary Moore seats, the Ross Poshton seats, and the Norman Momsen seat, and all three of those um, Republican legislators won their races handily. Alicia, that's true. I mean, the, the, the incumbents did very well. The Republicans did very well in the uh, House seats in our area of Iowa. Yeah, I think that was probably one of the bigger surprises of the night is that we did see, uh, you know, voters going to the, you know, considering the disapproval ratings of things, um, COVID, just the divisiveness that our country's in right now. I think it was really surprising because usually when you see public trends going that direction, you also see a whiplash towards inc incumbents, and we really didn't see that this cycle at all. Well, and as a matter of fact, I looked at, at a lot of the races in this area, and Alicia, I'll start with you. You take a look at Monica Kurth, the Democrat, winning 55% of the vote. Ross Poshtian, the Republican, 56% of the vote. Phyllis Thede, the Democrat, 56% of the vote. And uh, as we were saying, uh, Gary Moore, 55% of the vote. I mean, everything seemed to have fallen, whether you were a Democrat or a Republican, in an area of 55 to 45 in all of these races. Yeah, I know, and that, that is definitely, um, uh, you know, it's odd. That's kind of an anomaly that we don't see. Um, and it's interesting where we did lose um, incumbents. I know we lost a couple Democratic seats in the out, outer Des Moines area, and those are areas that uh, have been trending in local elections definitely towards the blue. And so it's really interesting to kind of see how it shook out. But yeah, definitely here, I would say incumbents really, really pulled it out this year. Well, and David, I mean, 55-45, 55-45, over and over again. I mean, does that not spell purple to you? Spells purple to me, and I think what we're seeing as far as those um, outer Des Moines seats is you're, you're seeing those were red seats until two years ago. Maybe it's just a return to the red, um, a return of suburban voters to the Republican Party, and to and to move forward and be successful in the future, the Republican Party is going to have to appeal to suburban voters. I think our our message appeals to suburban voters. We just have to make it more known because we will, we will carry suburban voters in the future if we have the right message. Well, David, I was looking at the exit polling for Iowa as well, and they took a look at Eastern Iowa in particular. In Eastern Iowa cities, according to exit polls, uh, Joseph Biden won 55% of the vote, but in East Central Iowa, which is basically our area of Iowa, it went about 55% for President Trump. Um, there's really, once again, we're talking purple once again, and, and also the fact that both Mr. Trump and Mr. Biden were both competitive in this area. Well, that, that's true, but remember four years ago, this area went for, for um, uh, Mr. Trump, now President Trump as well. Yep. So this is not a market, I mean, he won the second congressional district pretty handily in 2016 and won it again this year. Yeah, that was the, I don't know that how was the, did in the first district cuz that, that, and that's a good point because I mean uh, 4 years ago it was the 17th district which went democratic and it went for president Trump as well in Illinois and as you said the second district in Iowa went with uh, Dave Loebsack the democrat but also went with uh, president Trump Alicia I mean I, I don't want to relitigate 4 years ago but I mean it, it was kind of an interesting area to our area in particular to keep an eye as far as the the Biden Trump campaigns yeah, and I, you know, I think this sends a message to the candidates that were elected. I think, um, you know, the people want a divided government. And Iowa is no better, um, you know, example, I guess, of that than anywhere else in the country. 
And I think, you know, it sends a larger message that, you know, we need to start looking at ways we can work together across party aisle, uh, party lines and for the common good of Iowa and the, the United States. And so, you know, I think I think all of our our, our candidates who are elected and, and who have a victory this time, I really do hope that they all take it, regardless of party, all take it to heart and look and think about ways that we can start building um, building ourselves back from this this pandemic and just putting a new page forward in our in our history. Democrats really have a problem with rural America, it seems. In in Iowa in particular, uh, 63 percent of the rural vote in Iowa went for President Trump. What do Democrats have to do to win over more of the rural vote? Well, I think you started to see a little bit more um, of us, I guess, getting the message. Um, it's it seems very you know odd as you look at the economic impact of some of the president's policies and and things that we saw with ethanol it was kind of surprising actually to see him do as good in the Iowa rural areas as he did but I think you know we need to start looking at are are those the economic issues that people want us to be talking about or are there bigger things um, social issues or things that they're concerned about that we're not addressing and David, I mean, one of the big themes uh, from the president was not only we, we've turned the corner as far as COVID-19 is concerned, but also that he's going to be the one that's best able to rebuild the economy. That seemed to have resonated as well. Well, he's proven that he, he's, he, he's a good leader of the economy, has good policies um, on the economy. But I think what most, um, what I think plays a lot in the, in, um, the reason that the um, Farmers and the agricultural community favor Trump, President Trump is because he's worked for them. He's worked to renego renegotiate those poor trade deals. He's worked to um, um, rein in Chinese um, power over our markets. He's he's met their concerns. He's worked hard for them. They recognize that. I was out in the field with farmers during the uh, during the last summer, and I mean. They, the, the, the embargo was hurting them, but they were going to stick with President Trump. They were going to stick with him and, and see it through because they knew that they had to get tough on China, and the president did get tough on China, and it's reaping results. The Iowa exit poll, once again, and I keep going back to this, is that this was a survey of voters after they had voted. 82% of Iowans believe their financial situation is better now than it was four years ago. I was surprised at that number, 82%. Alicia, I mean... You can go back to the old Clinton campaign. It's the economy, economy, economy. And if people are voting their pocketbook, it sure seems like uh, Joe Biden didn't convince them that he was the man, as far as the economy is concerned, in Iowa. Yeah, and I think, you know, definitely I feel like the folks here, economy isn't as big of an issue as it is in other areas. We've, you know, been somewhat resilient to um, the pandemic and, and just other current events that are happening. Um, but I do think, you know, we're also one to lag behind. And I would, I would look back to the farm crisis of the 80s and see how that trickles down years after the federal, uh, you know, other states are, are recovering and, and, and in growth and we were still in decline. So I caution us to get too excited that the economy is going in the right direction. Um, I think that is an issue that will continue to, um, you know, be a topic of conversation, but definitely um, didn't, that was not the issue that, that the voters in Iowa were, were wanting to hear from Joe Biden. Well, and David, I was looking at the demographics too, as far as the uh, uh, income brackets are, those who make more than $100,000 in Iowa, $100,000, 50% voted for Joe Biden, 47% said they voted for President Trump. That's much closer than I would have anticipated. I would too, if it's the economy stupid, that certainly doesn't bear uh, witness to that truth. Um, because you would think people in that, in that income bracket would attribute some of their, their success at least to the underlying economy that has been promoted and has been not developed, but certainly enhanced by President Trump. I, I mean, Trump's policies have, I mean, unregulating the economy, renegotiating those trade deals, um, an easy money supply, those, those are the, um, the tools you use to build a strong economy, and they were utilized successfully by President Trump. Let's talk about gender then, too, because uh, this was an interesting issue, is that um, it was a belief that uh, President Trump had a huge issue with women, white women in particular, and in Iowa, according to this exit poll, once again, 50% of white women backed Joe Biden, but still 
backed Donald Trump, David, that's also a bit of a surprising number to me if that theory that President Trump had a problem with white women was absolutely true. Well, I don't know. I don't know that the, the, the real reason for that. I can speculate that, that Trump's position on um, abortion aligns with a lot of white women, and that may have been the factor that caused a lot of white women to, to vote for, for President Trump. And the fact that they're, they're seeing that their families are doing better. And Trump's, Trump gets a lot of credit, rightfully so, for that, and that would be another reason why the, by women or actually anyone would vote for President Trump. Alicia, I mean, how, how do you read the tea leaves for that as far as, as the, the female vote in 2020 is concerned for the president? Well, and it's interesting, obviously, Iowa's got a lot of white women. <laughs> so we're, we're a pretty um, white state. Uh, our minority population is, is not that, that high. So it is hard to kind of see where that, where that skew or where that would diff make that difference in the exit polling. But I'd also say that that was the, the group that carried him. And I don't know that the, him not having any white women supporting him was necessarily the case. It just wasn't in the large quantity that they had last time. And I think that that was kind of a mixed message getting sent through the media. Is it's not really about, you know, the, the huge um, amount of people that aren't supporting him. He still had, you know, part of his base, obviously, with him. Um, but he also picked up in other areas. He did very well with the Latino vote. Um, and so there's areas that typically Democrats have done better in and that we just did not see um, the performance um, and, and those correlate into votes. But sometimes you wonder why not? I mean, four years ago, Hillary Clinton didn't do as well with the Hispanic vote as people thought she would then. I mean, let's be honest, in the last, uh, if you go back to the Romney campaign and when Republicans dissected that election, they were saying Republicans have a Hispanic problem, and it just doesn't seem to play out, especially when the number of Hispanic voters is increasing so much more. You would think that the Democrats would be banking on that, and that doesn't seem to be true, Alicia. Um, yeah, no, I think it's definitely something we as a party, we try to be the big tent party and inclusive of everybody um, and enjoy celebrating diversity. And I think, you know, as a party, that will be something that will be postmortem probably discussions within the Democratic uh, leadership circles is, is how do we start coming back from that and how do we start communicating with that voter base a little bit better? Well, and David, I mean, the, the, the now, people, can I, the can people I just of say that, yeah, yeah, go ahead. The Republican. The Republicans are a big tent too. We we celebrate diversity, and we certainly want to have a diverse party. And we think that you know, the the, the um, Latins that are the Latinos that are now voting for our Republicans is reflective of our outreach. And that's what I was going to point out because if you think about it, if you look at the Republican convention, there were very many people of color that that spoke in defense of the Republican Party and the president as well. I mean, does this show pretty much that the Republicans are on the right track to garner more minority votes in the future? Yes, I think so. I think that you you saw it at the convention, you see it at the candidates. We have a number of African American candidates who are Republicans who won last night. And that's that's reflective of, of our the inclusive policies that we have. You know, white white people, Latinos, um, African Americans, we all have the same values. We all we all want a strong family. We want a strong economy. We want to be able to pray um, to our to our God in our in our own way. We 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 have the same values. We have the same desires, and we're speaking to that now. We're, and we're recognizing that we're all in this together. We have the same values. David, let's, let's talk about the days and weeks ahead. Usually after an election, there's a big call of coming together. But on the national scene, this is such a close election and there's still votes to be counted. Are you worried that as Americans that we're not gonna come together very quickly after this election? Well, I think there's, Yes, I do worry that we won't we won't come together quickly after this this election. But I don't think it'll be the fault of um, anybody in the Republican Party. I think the Republicans are, are are ready to come together. We're ready to govern. We're ready to do the people's works, and that's what we intend to do. But you don't think that the president has a role in this? I mean, uh, the president's already talking about you know the fact that it's a rigged system and all that. That's not really bringing people together. 
Well, he's concerned about that because that if that if that caused the election to tilt one way or the other, then certainly he's got to take that that issue and and um, take it to its logical extreme, which is probably filing a lawsuit and um, righting the the wrongs that were if there were any that were made during the election. So you know, there's got to be some confrontation in order to make sure that your system was fair and that every vote was counted and counted once. But there also has to be some kind of a conclusion too, right? Well, of course, there's going to be a conclusion. The conclusion will be when, when it's all said and done, and if it goes to court, it will be when the court makes its decision. And Alicia, I think that's the thing is that, I mean, we're talking about coming together and we're talking about a conclusion to this election, and one person's conclusion is not necessarily another person's conclusion. You could, you could fight this into court for quite some time. Absolutely. Um, yeah, no, it's definitely it's definitely going to be a sensitive area for both sides. I think, you know, either if you win or if you lose either side, this is not a good situation. And it's actually, you know, it's not really good for either party, in my opinion, because as you move forward, it's hard to govern uh, when, when you have a country that's this divided. So like I had said, mentioned earlier, it's it's really something that we need to start looking past the divisiveness and start looking at ways we can unite and come together, um, regardless of, of what the outcome is. And I know, you know, it's been hard and it and you do have President Trump, um, you know, kind of egging on his supporters to kind of question what the process and what's happening. Um, but, you know, we really do have to trust our system. It's it's held up in our country for hundreds of years and we have to, we have to respect that and hope that it'll continue that way. Alicia, what's the big takeaway from the year 2020? Well, I think um, what I, I guess my my biggest surprise was um, how the, it was it, we thought it was going to be a year of change and it seemed to be year, more of a year of status quo. Um, you saw a lot of like we mentioned earlier, a lot of the incumbents were protected. Um, we, we, we pretty much saw incumbents across the board doing really, really well, and that's Democrat and Republican. So um, I don't think it was a sweeping um, change election that we maybe saw in 2008 with Barack Obama, but um, you know, it definitely, uh, it, I think it, it definitely surprised a lot of people, and it'll continue to be an elec uh, election we talk about in political science classes for years, I'm sure. Yeah, every election is that way. David, what, what's your big takeaway from this uh, year 2020, this election? Well, I don't think it was the most consequential election of um, our lifetime, certainly not my lifetime. The most consequential uh, election of my lifetime was probably 1980, uh, the Reagan-Carter election. That was a consequential election. The winner of that election was going to have a profound impact on the future of the United States. I think with, with the, um, the protection you saw of the election of all the incumbents, you have an American people that certainly seems to indicate that they're in favor of the status quo. They're not for a lot of a lot of change. They're certainly not for ditching our constitutional system of government, which was on the minds of a lot of people on the left, you know, attacking the Supreme Court, which won't happen now with the Republican Senate, or um, you know, statehood for um, D.C. And, and Puerto Rico. That probably won't happen, and. Um, you won't see a lot of socialist policies get through a Republican Senate in the next two years. Our thanks to Scott County Democratic Chair Alicia Gaiman and Scott County Republican Chair David Millage. On the air, on the radio, on the web, and on your mobile device, and now streaming on your computer. Thanks for taking some time to join us as we talk about the issues on the cities. Wheelan Presley Funeral Home and Crematory, a proud supporter of WQPT, has been serving Quad City families since 1889. Now providing live stream capabilities for viewing your loved one's funeral or memorial service at their chapel in Rock Island.